We are very pleased to have Sister Damian Marie Savino with us to continue the conversation that we started last week with uh, Dr. Nordman of Grand Valley State University on uh, civic ecology. And uh, this woman has quite a resume. <laughs> Sister Damian Marie Savino has been the Dean of Science and Sustainability at Aquinas College since 2016. She has received her bachelor's degree in biogeography at McGill University in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. And her interest in the beauty and complexity of soils led her to pursue a master of science degree at the University of Connecticut. To integrate her faith with the sciences, she next earned a master's degree of theology at the Catholic University of America in Washington. Finally, she added a PhD in civil engineering also at the Catholic University. Her scientific research focused on environmental remediation of soil and groundwater contamination, the environmental impacts of endocrine disrupting to chemicals, did I say that right? Endocrine, endocrine. And the application of resilience theory to ecosystem health. Recently, she has become increasingly involved in the interdisciplinary projects and has lectured and written widely on Laudato C and integral ecology, as well as on science and faith, ecology and theology, and ecological restoration and health. After Sister Damien's presentation this evening, there will be time for questions and conversation. And please exhibit hospitality to our guests and civility to others by asking respectful and succinct questions. The presentation tonight is entitled Civic Ecology and the Laudato C Action Platform. Let's welcome Sister Damien Marie Savino. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I, um, I have to give pr credit to, to God, as, as my, my brothers always remind me that these degrees that I have, you know, they, they don't have anything past they barely tell me, they say they barely got past undergraduate work and they, they can't figure out what family I came from <laughs> <laughs> that I managed to get to have these degrees. But I, I do honestly give credit to God and to my religious community. So I'm a Franciscan sister of the Eucharist and I'm very delighted to be, to be here and to be part of this really fascinating series. And I see that Eric is here too and thank him very much for being willing to switch with me for last week, I had <clears throat> I wasn't able to be here. So, and I appreciate all the efforts of all of you for organizing this and uh, bringing persons into the Grand Rapids area together to discuss civic design. And so, I understand that's the topic that was given to us. <clears throat> and I will. I was quite intrigued by the guiding question and the goal of the series. So, I'm I'm quoting from your materials here, but. You ask the question, how do we thoughtfully plan and implement civic design so that cities are more equitable, just, sustainably, a sustainable, and ultimately good places to call home? And then you indicate in your programming materials that you are interested in exploring global models that could challenge or kind of expand our, our ideas of what works locally. So my focus this evening is going to be on what's called the Laudato C Action Platform, which is a global model for creation care that, that comes out of the Vatican. And I will be looking at how it relates to civic design and engagement. Focusing primarily on the notion of what's called integral ecology, and I'll explain what that is. That's a very central concept in Pope Francis's encyclical on uh, environmental stewardship, which is called Laudato Si. And in his mind, <clears throat> integral ecology is the marriage and the mutual relationship between natural ecology and human ecology. Um, and that's very much at the core of, as I understand it, of civic ecology as well. So I think there's a good relationship there. <clears throat> so I will begin by just reviewing some basic principles of civic ecology. I do have some experience with that work basically the work of Marianne <clears throat> Krasny and Keith Tidball of the Civic Ecology Lab at Cornell University in New York. 
But then I'll look at Laudato C, the Pope's encyclical on creation care, and the idea of integral ecology and how the Vatican is promoting what's called the Laudato Si Action Platform as a way of putting integral ecology into practice. And my purpose is to spur ideas and thoughts in all of you as to how the Laudato Si Action Platform can be of service to your efforts in, civ in civic ecology. So we'll see, see how this goes. And I hope there will be lots of questions, so don't be shy to ask questions afterwards. So first, what is civic ecology? <clears throat> and please forgive me if you all know this, but I just want to set a context for my words. It's interdisciplinary, it's community-based stewardship in which people and place are seen as interconnected and part of one system. And so civic ecology practices are like the ones shown on the slide, just as an example. They're local environmental stewardship actions that enhance green infrastructure and community well-being in cities and in other human-dominated systems. So it could be testing water, as they're doing in the bottom right, or community vegetable gardens, or planting and restoring wetlands. Those are all civic ecology <clears throat> actions or activities. And the group at Cornell University has basically 10 principles. And I want to just briefly <clears throat> review these. So where, where, do we, where do we do civic ecology? And basically, we do it in broken places, places that are degraded, that have been neglected or abandoned. Why do we do it? We do it because we love the place. The people living there love the places. They love what they've, the places that they've lost, and they're trying to reclaim and restore those places. And in recreating those places, in restoring those places, their civic ecology practices actually recreate community. So that's the community circle there, because people work together to do that. They also draw upon what we call social ecological memories to recreate those places and communities. As Michael mentioned, I did my doctoral work at the Catholic University of America, and my research was on the restoration of the Anacostia River in Washington, DC, <clears throat> which is one of the most degraded rivers in the region, if you know the area. Uh, and living in, along it are among the poorest and most um, marginalized human communities. Many of them are African-American communities whose ancestors were freed slaves who settled along the river after they were, they were freed. In my research, I basically studied the civic ecology of the river and the human communities there. And I proposed that in a restoration plan, we need to restore the human communities and the ecological communities, <clears throat> which I think they're they're working on quite actively there in Washington, D.C. now. But I spent one summer interviewing the residents, the African Americans, many of, I, I did about 30 interviews of different persons living along the river. And I heard many of their social ecological memories, stories of before the river was polluted. In the spring, there would be thousands of small fish coming up the river to spawn, which now, if you saw the river with the garbage floating in it, it's, it you would never be able to believe that that could have been the case. Or there is a um, the Seafarers Yacht Club, which was founded in 1945, and it's one of the oldest black boating organizations in the country. And some of the people I interviewed were part of that. So I heard many of their memories, social ecological memories of the river. And I think the question we need to ask is, are we restoring those memories too? Because many of the younger, younger people had no idea about any of these memories. And I, I know next week we have someone coming, to Dr. Ken Yoakum, to speak about uh, water and river restoration. And so it'll be interesting to hear his comments along these lines. And I think we could ask ourselves, are we doing any of this in relation to social ecological memories along the Grand Rapids River with the whole restoration effort that's going on? So that's a big part of civic ecology. Then we also improve ecosystem services when we do a good job on civic ecology practices. 
we foster well-being, so less stress when people are working outside, when they're able to be in clean, natural areas, when they have positive social interactions, working together, greater feelings of belonging, so just greater well-being and, and better health. <clears throat> we also, in civic ecology, provide opportunities for learning, so learning how to do technical things and how to relate to one another. And then moving out from that second circle to larger scale, so how do civic ecology practices interact with the larger global communities? And of course, so governance, oftentimes civic ecology practices start out as local innovations and then they cascade and expand into regional, perhaps regional areas or encompassing multiple partnerships across regions. Um, they also increase the social ecological resilience of both ecological and human communities. So in the face of stressors like crime in human communities or like climate change in e ecological communities, the systems become more resilient to those stressors as a result of if the civic ecology practices are effective. And then of course policymakers also have a role, an important role, in, in expanding civic ecology practices and supporting them. Now, so what is Laudato Si? And before the talk, I had a few people asking me that, so now I get to answer the question. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, it's an encyclical, we call it, basically a, a, a writing with a great deal of authority in the Catholic Church. It was written by Pope Francis, and the whole theme of it was care for creation. It came out in 2015, and Laudato Si is actually the, the Umbrian dialect in Italian for praise be to thee, and it comes from the opening phrases of St. Francis of Assisi's Canticle of the Creature, where he says, praise be to thee, Lord, for brother sun and sister moon. M most of you have probably heard that. So that's why it's called Laudato Si. And it's kind of a groundbreaking statement and in the, he, he's building on what the posts before have talked about. So in the Catholic Church, there has been for the past 50 years much more interest in environmental questions. But Laudato Si is a real punch, a real clarion call for ecological conversion. And the Pope says, this isn't just for Catholics. I'm writing this for the whole world. And the whole world, many different religions and even people who are not religious have interacted with this document. So I, I would encourage you all to read it. You can find it online if you Google it and you can get a copy. But in it, Pope Francis asserts, and I quote, living our vocation to be protectors of God's handiwork is essential to a life of virtue. It is not an optional or a secondary aspect of our Christian experience. So he's putting it right in the center of our Christian life. And the way it's organized even can be instructive for us in terms of how we approach these questions of caring for creation and of civic ecology. So what he does in chapter one, he starts with the science and he looks at questions of biodiversity loss, water shortages, water pollution, climate change, global inequities, the decline of human society that has accompanied all these scientific, all these ecological challenges. Then in chapter two, he looks at the theology and he brings the science into dialogue with a theology of creation, basically recognizing the intrinsic goodness of all creatures, while at the same time asserting that we humans have a very particular responsibility to care for creation, and that caring for creation can actually be a, a way of living a virtuous life, which I think is a, a beautiful way of looking at it. Then in chapter three, he says, but hold on, folks we got to look at the human roots of this crisis. What attitudes in ourselves are responsible for where, how we've gotten into this mess? And he highlights the ones that he feels are most important and encourages us to honestly confront those attitudes and actions. Then in chapter four, that's his answer, integral ecology. He says, this is my answer to the ecological crisis. So we have to get win-win situations where the human and the natural ecology are both winning. They're both benefiting by our solutions because so often they seem to be fighting with each other and at odds with one another. Now, so that's, that's similar to civic ecology, certainly very harmonious with civil, civic ecology, 
but it's probably even more comprehensive because he, he speaks about there's environmental, social, economic, cultural ecology. He also talks about the ecology of daily life, so the little things we do every day. Uh, the principle of the common good, as Dr. Nordman, I think, spoke about last week. Intergenerational solidarity, so not just solidarity across other cultures and peoples, but between generations. All of these are part of the kind of integral ecology he's talking about. And it's all f should be flowing out of sort of an internal ecological conversion that motivates us to external behaviors. But the internal conversion is what's motivating it, not just external behaviors. Then after he speaks about integral ecology, then in chapters five and six, it's like, well, this is how you put it in practice. So the macro scale <coughs> politics and economics in chapter five, and then micro scale education and spirituality in chapter six. So it's a pretty comprehensive document. But um, just, I think, a wonderful, I guess, a, just a wonderful way to put this in a bigger global perspective. And as I said, the encyclical wasn't written only for Catholics. He's very explicit that it's for all peoples. And so because responding to the ecological challenges requires us to come to know ourselves as being part of a human family. Now, so if I'm going to try, and I might need your help here. I'm right here. So, because I want, would like to show a little video here, but um, I'm going to let you do it. <laughs> the global ecological crisis that we find ourselves in today presents not only one of the biggest threats to the human family, but also to all life on Earth. The ecological crisis is made up of a wide assortment of interconnected problems, ranging from climate change to biodiversity loss from resource depletion to air pollution, from soil degradation to plastic pollution, plus many more. All these crises each pose significant challenges to the global family, not only in their complexity, but also in scale. Faced with this global and urgent threat, many believe that we can engineer our way out of this crisis. After all, technology and the industrial revolution got us into this mess Therefore, technology and human ingenuity can get us out of it. But trying to solve the ecological crisis by developing new technical solutions can only treat the symptoms, not the cause. For the crisis we now face, given its complexity and interconnectedness, demands a new approach if we're to treat its roots. This requires a new way of seeing, thinking and acting. The Catholic Church calls this integral ecology, and this approach offers a profound insight into how we can tackle the ecological crisis in an integrated way. When we view the crisis through the lens of integral ecology, rather than seeing each discrete problem in isolation, we begin to see that everything is deeply interconnected. This integrated view reveals a deeper insight. Not only are the ecological problems interconnected, but there is also an interconnection between the ecological crisis and the human crisis. For the human crisis, just like the ecological one, is made up of a wide range of issues affecting the human family, from extreme poverty to social inequality, from modern slavery to human trafficking, from poor working conditions to mass migration, and many more. Through the lens of integral ecology, we can see that we are faced not with two separate crises, one environmental and the other social, but rather with one complex crisis, which is both human and environmental. Or, to put it another way, the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor are the same cry. Everything is interconnected. The insatiable desire for economic growth drives the production and market for ever cheaper consumer goods which drives the depletion of Earth's natural resources and is also a driver for cheap labor, which drives poor working conditions, which drives weak environmental standards, which drives pollution, which drives greenhouse emissions, which drives climate change. All of these issues are interconnected, and each problem cannot be solved without tackling the others. Integral ecology shows us that the ecological crisis is not simply a series of problems to be fixed, but rather is a symptom of something that goes much deeper. 
because at the heart of the ecological crisis lies a deep human and spiritual crisis in that we have forgotten who we are and where we have come from. Nature is not something separate from ourselves or a mere setting in which we live, but rather we are part of nature, included in it and in constant interaction with it. We have forgotten that we ourselves are dust of the earth. Our very bodies are made up of her elements. We breathe her air and we receive life and refreshment from her waters. Just as ecology is the relationship of living organisms and their environment, we cannot regard ourselves as separate or disconnected with the ecosystems in which we live. Just as the Earth's ecosystems have worked harmoniously for millions of years, we too are part of a complex network of interconnected relationships that we may never fully comprehend or understand. When we forget where we belong, we behave as lords and masters over creation, entitled to plunder her at will. Creation is viewed simply as an object to exploit. And that same mindset of domination is how we treat each other. When we view reality through the lens of integral ecology, we can see how all creation is a web of life that includes human and social dimensions. By understanding where we belong and our interconnectedness within the ecosystems that sustain us, we will no longer see God's creation as an object there simply to serve our needs, but rather we come to a deeper understanding of our interdependence and our place of belonging within the delicate web of life. And by doing so, we can start to care for each other as well as the earth, our common home. And given the urgency of our current situation, this new way of thinking and acting is needed now more than ever. Okay, good. Okay, so that kind of gives you the sense of where he's coming from with this idea of integral ecology, and many people are working with this now globally. Ultimately, it has a Franciscan root, so Pope Francis took the name after St. Francis of Assisi, so being a Franciscan sister of the Eucharist, I have to speak about the Franciscan element of it, but I think it's something that, I think St. Francis, he was a reformer in his own day, and I feel like he could really add to the whole dialogue in our day, 800 years later. So it, Pope Francis talks about St. Francis being an exemplar of the kind of integral ecology so a witness or someone that we can follow for the kind of ecology he's talking about. He is named the patron saint of ecologists, and he's loved universally by Christians and non-Christians. He lived in harmony with God, with others, with nature, and with himself. And there's a key paragraph in the encyclical where the Pope says that our key hum human relationships are with God, with others and with the earth. So those three are our fundamental relationships. So when we examine ourselves, how are we doing in life? Those are the three we should be looking at, our relationship with God, with others, and with the earth. And St. Francis of Assisi was an exemplar of being aware of those three and, and really having beautiful relationships with all three. He was very concerned with the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. So for St. Francis, those two were connected. And as you heard in the video, in ecological um, stewardship, those two are very interconnected between the human and natural ecology. The cry, and I saw that so much in the Anacostia, as the river degraded, the human communities went right down with it. And what my hope was in the work I was doing was, if we restore the river, can we raise up the human communities along with it, you know, the other way around? Um, and then his response to the world so was so much more than, than some kind of economic calculus or even just an intellectual appreciation. He was united to every creature with a sense of affection. That's why he could call them brother and sister, so a fraternal love. And I think that's very important. It was love that motivated St. Francis. And it needs to be ultimately love, love of God, the creator, that flows out to love of others and love of the earth that needs to motivate and be at the heart of anything we do in civic ecology. And 
and that was Francis witness to that, St. Francis. And then this, this sense of he was so, I guess, connected to nature that he did not want it to be in any way something to be controlled or used. And how often do we do that? Because again, we can become masters and dominators very easily when we view nature as something I need my, my needs satisfied and I'm not going to limit my needs. And somehow when we, when we have a sense of awe and wonder about creation, it's easier for us not to be that kind of master and dominator and to actually want the nature to flourish, right? When, and if you're a gardener, you know this, right? I mean, you want to do everything you can so that your vegetables flourish, even if you're going to harvest them. But you want, you want your farm to, to flourish. And that generally, if done well, is more a refusal to, to make reality something that you control and that you dominate. Often it works best if you find the patterns that are within the nature and go with those. I know we as sisters, we have 230 acres, and we're really trying to work with that, getting to know how we can build up the soil, how we can um, use natural ways of enhancing the biodiversity on our land. And then we have to put less fer fertilizers, less pesticides, because the, the, the rhythms in the land itself, because nature's like a book and we're trying to learn how to read it. <laughs> And the better we can read it, the better we treat the natural world. And I think St. Francis was a very strong witness to that, that way, that kind of fraternal way, that listening way of being in nature. And that's very important in order to live integral ecology well. OK, so now what is the Laudato Si Action Platform? And it's, it's abbreviated LSAP. So um, it's, it's an offering of the dicastery, what's called the dicastery, basically that's an office in the Vatican. And this dicastery is called Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development. They are making a strong effort to put Laudato Si into practice. So it was a big thing that the Pope came out with this encyclical, but now he's saying, okay, but let's do it, right? So we can't, we read it, but let's do it. And so the platform is a way that, that the Vatican is trying to encourage groups around the world to put that into practice. So it's offered as a service to institutions within the Catholic Church, but also to all people. And so that's why I thought it would be interesting to bring it up this evening. Now there's, there's several elements that are in it. So it, it's in no way prescriptive, but it's meant to help groups to come up with plans for putting Laudato Si into practice. So there is practical guidance, and if you go to the website, laudatosiactionplatform.org, there are um, many resources there for practical guidance for communities and institutions. And the second goal is to foster community. So to bring groups together and even potentially help them to collaborate with one another, but at least to know about what we're doing. So you know, you can hear about people, what people are doing in the Philippines, what people are doing in Europe, what people are doing in Africa. So to promote sharing between different groups around the world, so to build solidarity and uh, learn from one another. And the, the bottom line, what, what we are uh, encouraged to do through the platform is actually to come up with an action plan for your institution. And there are various guides for how to do that. So, so a little more on the concretes. Basically, it's designed for seven sectors, which are meant to be as comprehensive as possible to cover the major sectors of civic life. There are towards seven goals, and those seven goals come directly out of the encyclical over a seven-year planning period. So for, and these are the seven sectors. So families, all families and individuals, you could sign up for this. So you can actually go on the website and register. So at Aquinas College, for example, we're in the insti uh, educational institutions. So we have signed up as a university for the platform. And that means now that we're getting people together, we're kind of looking at baseline. Where are we baseline in terms of the seven goals, which I'll share with you in a moment. Then we're going to meet together and plan out how we're going to meet these goals over the next seven years. And what the hope is, 
is that we'll actually make some concrete progress, right, by setting this all out. So there's a the beginning of the, the seven-year process is a planning time with a group in the institution. And then the other years after that are putting those things into practice in, a, in an order that you, the institution itself decides. So there's nothing prescriptive saying you have to do this or that. And then the seventh year, hopefully, is a year of jubilee where you can celebrate what you've done. So, um, so there's families, parishes and dioceses, educational institutions, healthcare institutions, so hospitals, um, other organizations and groups like lay movements or communities or NGOs of various kinds, foundations. Then the economic centers, so businesses, farms, cooperatives, have their, they can in, embark on this process, and then religious orders. So my religious order, for example, we have signed up for this and will be embarking on a process with it. And then the seven goals. So they come directly, as I said, out of Laudato Si, and they're meant to help us to implement integral ecology in a way that's a win-win for both natural and human ecology. So we can start with cry of the earth, which is on the bottom, the green. So, and that, and some of the practicals under this area that they, they mention, and again, the institution does not have to do all of these, but these are some of the practicals. So, for example, greater use of clean, renewable energy, reducing fossil fuels, um, efforts to promote biodiversity, guaranteeing, guaranteeing access to clean water for all, et cetera. And it's, it's very important that this be flexible because, for example, I've been on a kind of global group for the university's sector, and we have people from the Philippines or the Congo. Their issues are quite different from what we're talking about here So in their universities. So it's, each, each institution has to tailor it to where their needs are, which I think is a beautiful way of approaching it. Then the cry of the poor. So Again, the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor go hand in hand. So things like um, special attention to vulnerable, vulnerable groups, such as indigenous communities, migrants, children, um, defense of human life from conception to death, um, and fighting against slavery and all kinds of abuses in order to be responsive to the cry of the poor. And the institution, again, would choose those, uh, which of those. Then ecological economics, so maybe fair trade, ethical consumption, ethical investments, divestments from fossil fuels. Many, some universities are doing that. Um, investment in renewable energy or development of renewable energy. So that's, that's that particular goal. Then adoption of simple lifestyles. So encouraging. So this is, we're working hard on this at Aquinas, but Things like maybe even avoiding single-use plastics or all the daily things we do, um, sobriety in our use of resources, reducing consumption, maybe having a more plant-based diet, if that's something you're interested in. Greater use of public transport could be another aspect of a simple lifestyle. Um, and then ecological education. And this is uh, something I'm working very hard on with the sisters, so I've been working on actually curricula to teach our young people what, what Laudato Si is about and how we might put Laudato Si into practice. So to get kind of a Laudato Si educational mindset and curricula, there's a great need for that, and maybe even reforms in educational institutions to educate, say, across the campus in relation to these issues, across disciplines. And then ecological spirituality, so helping persons to recover that vision of a religious vision of God's creation, that there actually is a God behind this creation, whatever religion you are, um, ex encouraging awe and wonder in relation as opposed to more reductionist attitudes. There is actually a season of creation that the Orthodox Christians originated and now the Catholic Church has embraced that just finished. So it begins on September 1 and ends on October 4th, which is the feast of St. Francis of Assisi. And different groups do all kinds of various celebrations, liturgical processions, and that sort of thing during the season of creation. And you have people around the world doing that in many different religions, most of them Christian, but you know, at least pretty widely spread. So that's something that's spreading, and that promotes ecological spirituality. 
And then finally, the community involvement and participatory action. So whether it's local or regional levels or even national and international, so promoting advo advocacy of various types, people's campaigns, um, rootedness in your local places. So what watershed are you in? And encouraging that kind of participatory uh, work together. So those, I think that hopefully that gives you a feel for the, the sort of breadth that's there and the possibilities that are there for groups that want to engage in that. And again, it does, it relates directly to civic ecology, but it kind of puts it in a bigger framework and gives, helps give you some guidelines with those seven goals and then the sort of seven year planning process too, which so you can set your own markers along the way, but the, the Vatican dicastery will you know, provide you any resources or guidelines, and, and they have a listing of everyone who's registered, you know, and will be trying to get all these groups together. Um, so I think just my final slide then, just to return to the goal of this series um, and the question that I was so intrigued with that's motivating the series, how do we thoughtfully plan and implement civic design so that cities are more equitable, just, sustainable, and ultimately good places to call home. And I think, I hope that, well, and we can have more discussion on this too in the Q&A, but it seems that to answer this question, the Laudato Si Action Platform could be a great resource to help civic ecology efforts. So both in its, its methodology and in the content of what it offers there. It's a global model that can be brought into conversation with more local models, which is another one of the goals of your series. So to expand our ideas maybe of what could work locally and how we might be able to do it. And so I think those, those seven sectors are concrete groups and the seven goals are concrete actions to, to head toward. And so I think those working toward those seven goals could be a way of promoting civic ecology in our local um, organizations and communities. And then maybe, maybe some would be interested in developing something like a Laudato Si action plan. Or, and it doesn't have to be exactly like that, the seven years and the seven goals, but it might help put a framework on those. So to put the civic ecology into uh, a broader context, or if, if nothing else, just to provide some, some global input into the civic ecology efforts. And so, and so I think I will stop there and hopefully leave some time for questions. So thank you very much. Some questions for Sister Damon? Yes. generally over the world, and especially in high population areas, are getting more and more urbanized. Um, do you have any examples of programs that are working in urbanized areas? So, yeah, some examples of some cities that have been able to make some changes. Sure. Yeah, and maybe I'll just speak more from personal experience, but I think there's many examples. But So right down the road in Detroit, there's a group called the Greening of Detroit, and they, again, you need kind of an entrepreneurial spirit for all of this too, to, to kind of enter in joyfully and try it. But they, my understanding is they were very distressed by just sort of the, the loss of real estate. And uh, you know how Detroit is, just the kind of bombed out areas. So they came up with the idea of, well, these lots are just sitting here. Let's green them up. And they, they've really expanded their, their work over the past, I've known about them for maybe 10 years, and they've really expanded their work. So it's built, they have young people in some places building uh, raised bed gardens in these areas. They've, um, they do it downtown, they do it on the edges of town. They have one um, orchard they took me to see where they have Muslim communities on one corner, Christian communities on another corner, and another religious group on the other corner, and all of them worked together planting this orchard. And it was absolutely gorgeous. And they basically planted grass and then planted the trees in the grass. And it used to be just a, you know, a derelict area. 
So those kinds of things, and yet, again, they start small, but they, they tend to cascade outward. And they've gotten some good grant monies and things for their work. Another one that I participated in before I came back to Michigan in 2016, I was living in Houston. And working the college I was working at was right in downtown Houston. And we wanted, we had a one half acre lot on the campus that was just sort of sitting there. And my students wanted to build raised bed gardens. So, okay, in a class, we, we built the raised beds. They had to design them and they built them. And then, you know, we were wrestling with how do we get the students to take care of these things? Because it's great, you built these, but now I'm not going to be the one out there watering all the time. You know, you guys have to do this. Well, then I was approached by an alum. And she had the idea of what she called planted forward farms. And they're, they're still going now. She and her brother were lawyers. And they had contact with a Congolese refugee community. So a lot of Congolese go into Houston, apparently. And many of them come from farming backgrounds in the Congo and get into Houston, where they you know, join up with their community. But they're not going to be ready for urban life. They want to, that's what they know how to do is farm. So her idea was, gee, could we set them up on urban farms? And, and would they make enough money on that in order to get themselves established? And maybe after five years or something, they would know the language better and everything, and they could go on and get another job. So we, at the university where I was, we said, OK, we'll, we'll be one of the farms. And so we have this, and it's still the same farmer Roy. The Lemba is still there after, he's still eight years now. He farms the whole area, takes care of it. And I used to bring my students out. He would teach them. He, he not only spoke Swahili and whatever his dialogue was in the Congo, he spoke Russian because he had gone from the Congo to Russia, was very unhappy there, and then came back. And then he was speaking English. So my students were just in awe of this. You know, you think of him as such a poor person, right, a, a refugee. And he was amazing, and he taught them how to farm. So now they have these little farms all over the city doing this. And when they come out to harvest, all the Congolese come out, and they harvest that, that particular farm. And then they go to the next one and harvest that one. And then we set up a, you know, a little farmer's market on campus. And they have these all around the city now. Those are two examples, but there's many, many that are along those lines. And it's not difficult to do, and it's not expensive to do either. It just takes that, I think, entrepreneurial spirit and the desire to get communities together. And there are certainly communities waiting for that. So, And we will need to do more and more of that, because you're right, everything's so urbanized. And the urban areas are in decay in many cases. But, yes? The was this. Yeah, um, I don't know why it's not, <laughs> but it certainly should be. Um, Yeah. There, there was just much more thoughtful, uh, you know, ecological integration. And so it seems like government has to be a piece of here as well as elsewhere. Yeah. And no, and that's a good point. So it's certainly something to be paid attention to. Probably all of these sectors would want to try tie into, you know, the, the go governance aspect, right? So it, the government might be something that's kind of um, overseeing all of these or in relationship with all of these. But, or certainly could be its own sector, too, if somebody, this is, this is sort of like a template that's meant to be adapted as communities would, would want to. So very good suggestion. So. Yes? Do you know if the Rector's Diocese has signed on for the Lato Seed? I don't believe it has. Now, I've been, we've been trying to, um, it, it's more, it's not a lack of desire, because I know the bishop is interested in this. It's a lack of, of resources 
like they just don't have someone in the diocese who can take this on. The person they have is doing a million other things. And if there are, I mean, I've been trying to, to push on this gently a bit to get something going, and I haven't been able to get a lot of traction on it. If there are people here, and, you know, I'm always open if we wanted to try to get a group together, and I know the bishop would be, because I've spoken, you know, he has spoken with me about it a number of times, just uh, not sure where to go next with it. So if there is a, a drive, you know, as I speak with groups, I always like to, to ask about that. If there is a drive, then maybe we could get something more going. Um, or, or even, I think I could get also some people from the college, and, and Eric, you might be able to get some people from Grand Valley. I mean, maybe that would be of help to the diocese since they're short-staffed in this area, because the man who's working on it has so many social services he has to attend to, and he just can't fit this in. But it'd be worth further discussion. And I, I've left my email, so I'm always open to emails or just stopping by at Aquinas, and we could talk more about it. Um, so, and not well. If you're if you're a religious person, now we, one place to go is whatever your church or your parish is. If not, I mean, it depends on your interests. So, so for example, Calvin College does a lot with Plastic Creek Watershed, and they're, they're very active. And you can join those kinds of things. If you're interested in the Grand River, the whole Grand River restoration is a big thing now, and the not only restoring the rapids, but all of the walking trails and biking trails and all of that. So it kind of, I think you should go with your interests, you know, and then there are neighborhood groups that, um, oh, what's the, that grow local food too. What's the, ah, I know that he's a, an Aquinas grad and he's very active in growing food and getting it out to, I, I can get you that information if you email me. Um, I'm, I'm, lose, I'm not thinking of the name of his group right now, but they grow food and then try to get it into the get it out to the communities that don't have food. So if you're interested in food, there's many organizations, and there's also, you know, the community garden groups and that sort of thing. Um, so maybe it's always best to go with what your interests really are. If you're, I don't know, Eric, if you might have some other suggestions too. Yeah, from a uh, from the business side. Of there's the West Michigan Sustainable Business Forum. Yeah. Uh, they're very active. Uh, almost all the big companies around here are members, but also lots of small businesses do all sizes. Uh, WEMIAP, the West Michigan Environmental Action Council, is very active. Uh, so, yeah, like there are. There's so many so when many you say. Different aspects of it that you can think about. Yeah. Oh, Has sorry. there been any effort either here in Grand Rapids or in another community that you can speak to of? ecologically based organizations coming together and, and attempting to not work in such silos and to be able to look at Laudato C as a potential for better synergies across organizations with similar missions. No, I mean, not that I'm aware of, and I'm sorry if I'm, if I'm unaware. Um, it just seems like there's such a, a silo mentality within so many organizations. Well, I think, you know, it's complex. So I don't know that it's intended to be siloed, but, you know, you get a mission as an organization and you try to stay true to your mission. And then sometimes that, over time, acts to exclude <laughs> others. I think there's certainly a desire for collaboration. And the environmental efforts I, are probably more collaborative than many other groups. Um, and maybe maybe I'm just not as in touch with it, but I. This is why I feel like something like the platform could be, or or some kind of global framework can help tie together the local efforts, uh, and and so that's why I thought it was interesting to to speak about that today and maybe get people thinking along those lines. Um, so, 
I would say this region could use, because there's just tremendous work being done, but it's hard to get all the different groups together, you know. And I suppose if you had a, a seminar or something at one of the colleges and invited them specifically, that might be a way to kick it off uh, and just specifically went after, targeted those groups, which might be something to do. Yeah. Um, sister, do you know of anyone that's doing um, housing projects um, for, for vulnerable populations, but not just vulnerable populations that are more um, in the civic ecology kind of framework? Um, Okay, so this is, I should know more on this, but um, what is the group that, ICC. yeah, they, yeah, so, and that might be, um, thank you, I couldn't think of, that might be one place to go for that. And then there's also, of course, you know, Habitat for Humanity, they, they do some interesting work. And, yeah. Yeah. Not just for one segment of the population, but there's older and younger and, you know, all of that, so. I know, and that would, again, it's what we need to do, and it, I think, I, I think we, we have to get into, into the architecture side of things, the construction side of things. The Leadership in Environmental and Energy, and Energy Design LEAD program for buildings is, is good for encouraging that, you know, on a building specific basis. So, um, you know, to get a gold certification or whatever, um, but to do a whole community. Um, now there is, there's a man at St. Thomas Parish who's a landscape architect and he's doing some interesting work in Chicago trying to promote and in other places in the Midwest trying to promote that kind of development. And I could give you his contact information because he's, yeah, he's he's doing some very interesting work. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a great question. It's it would it would make our community so much more interesting too. Mm -hmm. But yeah, and having commons is part of those too. It would be really interesting. This is making me think we should have like a three day kind of think tank mm -hmm. seminar with this sort of thing. And with I think we'd get quite a good showing from this region and with some experts in different areas, you know, and so. This is less a question and more of a comment, but I'm just, I'm struck with the idea that it seems like with um, climate change, there is a way in which it is kind of motivating to think about how big the problem is. And uh, I really think that something like the um, Lagos FC Action Plan is a way to motivate because it brings us back to community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think the platform is trying to confront that, that sort of stumbling block in a way by just saying, okay, well, just sit down. You got seven years, here's some ideas, but you don't have to do them or choose them and start working on it and see how you do. Um, I, I think, unfortunately, in the whole environmental arena, there is, has tended to be a lot of negativity. And I find this even with my teaching I feel like, oh gosh, I'm just giving them kind of heavy stories here. So we want to flip it to, you have to be aware, so we can't just you know, run away or put blinders on. We have to be aware of what's going on, but let's be motivated to actually enter into it, to change. And one thing I love in Laudato Si is one section in the last chapter on ecological education and spirituality where he says that even if you turn off lights, say, and you're just one person doing it, but you do it out of love, that alone is an ecological conversion, and that is a wonderful act. 
And so I tell my students that because that's where it starts ultimately. And you want it to be motivated from an interior desire to do good, basically. And then I tell them, OK, but you might have been one person turning off that light. But someone else might see you do it and hear, or hear you talk about why you did it. And then they might turn off a light. And then they might turn off a light. And pretty soon, you've got a million people turning off lights. And now you're really making an impact. So I think also to keep that focus, that, and, and that's, I think, what is one of the motivations of the action platform is, OK, let's, we have, the Vatican knows, hey, we've got contacts. I mean, they have something like 300 million connections through this platform right around the world. It's some, some unbelievable number. Well, we can get this information out. Maybe, maybe a tenth of those people will bite and start doing something. But even so, that's still 300,000. You know, it's like, it's just, so I think, I think to try to keep that positive push and, and definitely having the connection between the natural and the human ecology is, is what drives it. Some people love nature, some people love human communities, and that's the love that, that motivates that. And if you get really connected to a community, I mean, I became, I really fell in love with the Anacostia River community, the people there. We just, and I had read all the scientific reports and everything. I understood more about the river after interviewing those 30 people that summer than I understood from all the scientific reports. And in fact, sometimes they would say little notes like, uh, we don't know why this is such and such. And I would say, well, I know why, because they told me. <laughs> because this is what was happening before World War II. And after World War II, this happened, the way you built your highways and all of that. And it changed the whole flow of the river. Um, so I think that kind of love and of the human communities, too, drives a lot of this and, and should drive it. Um, and certainly, that's one thing Laudato Si is trying to get us to look at. But yeah, so it's a beautiful comment that you made. Yeah. Yes. Just to kind of piggyback on that, I mean, I think it's always nice to hear about those like success stories and stuff like that. I mean, even just the fact that you were able to um, get the human side of the story and you're telling us and now we understand that there is always that human side to these sorts of to the environment it's not just nature but it's like you like you say the human interaction with it and I think I, I worked on a project a really long time ago in Detroit it was like around like um, the ambassador bridge and just sort of the impact on the southwest Detroit community and Oh, over it, we I had some student interns working on it and stuff, but over time, um, they over time they decided to build a second bridge, also in Southwest Detroit. And um, but I think, if I recall, and this was this happened after I moved here to Grand Rapids, but I think they did fight for like a community benefit. Um, they did some community, like some studies and. There's a lot of student, there was students and community groups and stuff working on it, and I, I do think like with that Gordy Howe Bridge, there was some success around getting a community benefit to it, and so Good. it wasn't just this bridge being put on people, even mm -hmm. though even though it was to some degree, but there was community voice, um, and I don't know that gives me hope, and that, that when people act, good things can happen. Um, yeah, and that's that's very important because many times in the marginalized communities, they don't uh, they don't even know they can speak, you know, or they're they're so fragmented that it's hard for them to get together to speak. So if they were able to speak, I mean, that's major. That's kind of major. Again, getting some concretes, uh, you know, like in the platform or in civic ecology practices. It helps people organize around a particular mm -hmm. something. Like, for example, that, that, um, that orchard in Detroit mm -hmm. that they brought me to. Yeah. Well, that was the reason. I mean, otherwise, you know, the Muslims aren't going to talk to the Christian. Like, they just told me it was so polarized. I think the other group was African Americans who didn't want to relate to either of the other groups. But when they know they're going to go out there and plant trees, eventually, you, know, you start to see, well, that's. He or she's just a person. Mm -hmm. 
just like I am. And, you know, but you organize around that concrete exterior work. And so that, I think, is, that's the value of like the civic ecology experiences, because it's a, it's a concrete work that brings people together and sort of naturally, hopefully over time, could break down some of those barriers, especially if they start to see something growing and they can go out there and pick apples together and all of that. We, we did that, I, when I was living in DC, we were part of a community garden that we joined, and it was an international community garden. And it was sort of, if you looked at it from, if you didn't know what was going on, you'd be like, this place is a mess. But we go in there and we had an Indian family next to ours. Well, they grew their vegetables totally differently. And they had all kinds of steaks and things and hanging all over and all that. And they were growing totally different vegetables. And eat, there were all these different ethnic groups growing things there in different ways. But it was wonderful. And then occasionally, you'd go to your garden to harvest, and you'd see a whole pile of these whatever kinds of vegetables they were by your garden that they had extra, and they gave them to you. Then you'd start talking, well, how do you fix this? How, what, is, what is this? How do you eat it? And so there was all this kind of international exchange. I just love that about the community garden. And we didn't intend that when we started it. We just wanted to be part of a community garden. But so other things sometimes happen that you don't plan, too, in terms of relationships. And that's why it's worth giving it a shot to try some of this, because sometimes things happen that you just never expected, you know, or people begin to care about one another in ways that you didn't expect. Um, so. Thank you.